Okay, <clears throat> let me call to order our special city council meeting workshop of December 1st. Uh, second item on the agenda is discussion, review, and possible action regarding ordinance number 3342. Dan, continue. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, one thing I just want to kind of recap what we did last time. We went through uh, Articles 1 through Working 3. Working with the Oklahoma Film and Music Office in has the been staff a report, real joy and pleasure, was, actually. Uh, They've helped us, the um, first and foremost, with locations to shoot in a cave like this to, and to recreate the scene that we want. Is it one of the most difficult locations? between uh, modular home and uh, mobile and manufactured home. Uh, essentially, the definition stayed the same. I just had the titles wrong. So the definition is for a mobile manufactured home, which would still remain a special use permit anywhere in the city. And then a modular home would be the one to where it still has to meet all the current uh, building code requirements as well as any of the architectural design standards in that. So in a more updated one, those were uh, switched around. But as I indicated, all the other stuff has uh, been changed per our discussion. So now we're in article. Question for clarity. Oh, yes. Okay. On, a, on, a, on the, the modular home? Yes. Is that something that is or is not pre-wired, pre-plumbed? Is it just a snap together thing? Or yeah, I mean it can be. I don't know how you'd meet codes if they weren't already. Made. Well, the, through the man, through basically the facility and where it's built, because it's still something that can be taken as usually maybe a couple pieces to a property in that. So through that uh, manufacturing, if you want to say process, it is. I'm just trying to understand yeah. modular as opposed to the other. Yeah, and, and, and it is. Because I don't know how they'd snap together if they're, I don't know how you'd do that. Well, yeah, and on the construction side, to be honest with you, I, I don't know that, you know, Okay. Exactly. Either well, I just know that it, I you don't yeah, my, okay. it, it'll meet all the respective codes as a on-site stick-built home would. Okay. And that's the difference. And the other one is that's why I thought maybe right. they had to be wired and plumbed and all that. Yeah. Too. And then a, and then a mobile home modular is the one where it is typically on a chassis that is brought in and a lot of times just put their skirts around it, that type of thing, and doesn't okay. necessarily. Some of them may be old enough that they don't even meet the current building code requirements, okay. you know, like, so anyway, there's that distinction in there. So now we're going on to Article 4, which starts to get into the, if you want to say, nuts and bolts of each zoning district. Uh, as we talked about uh, in Article 3, there's a couple new zoning districts that have been added, and we'll be going over those. But in the agricultural zoning districts, there was essentially just some minor changes to the land use table. Uh, for instance, there was the incorporation of medical marijuana because uh, we allow grow facilities in the agricultural zone district. So that was put in there uh, as one of the land use updates in the table. Uh, there was uh, also the, um, I think there was, and then of course, as I said, the modular mobile home manufactured home distinction. Uh, and I think that was probably, there's the, oh, and then the telecommunication towers, which we'll talk about later. That again was put into the uh, land use table. Uh, minor residential and major residential. Again, we'll get into the nuts and bolts of those later. Uh, and then some general kind of cleanup with some of the stuff, but there wasn't a significant change in a lot of the uses that are either permitted or uh, not permitted. But also to go back, you'll notice one of the things I did is in each area, I combine or put all of the zoning districts at the beginning along with their explanation of what each of them do. And then instead of having a bunch of notes at the end of the tables, uh, I took that and put it as standards uh, in that so it's much clearer and easier to find in there rather than having it as footnotes of a table. Uh, let's see, whoops. Yeah, and, as I, and then uh, in all of our zoning districts, there were updates to the um, setbacks, lot coverages and that, and again, we'll go over each of those. But one of the things that each of our zoning districts had was probably three or four scenarios for setbacks. It, it really honestly didn't make sense. It's kind of back to an older code uh, type uh, thing. So 
what I had done is take it to simplify it where we have, you know, typically a 25 foot front setback, a 20 foot rear setback and five foot on each side. It went further to, in my uh, mind, further restrict the backyard because we had lot coverage for overall lot as well as lot coverages that was specific to the rear yard. And, you know, as I've said before with a lot of the other stuff, it really added problems to people trying to develop properties, whether it's a house, whether it's accessory structures. So we're going to a flat, you know, lot coverage for the whole lot. And then again, the standardized setbacks instead of, you know, even having where it says from rights away and all of that. Again, none of it's really going to change what we're doing. It just makes it easier and, and more simplified uh, within there. And, and as I indicated, in the A2, the lot coverage did uh, increase uh, to, I think, a 35%. Uh, I lost my marker here. I should have done like Leroy and had my yellow tabs on there. Uh, the A2, sorry about that. Let me see. Went Are you to on page 31 slash 38? But yeah, I was going to say mine is probably different than yours if you're doing it off of yours, but... The lot coverage uh, is 35%. It was 25% and went 35%. And you'll notice that'll be consistent because even in our R1 right now, it's 25% and the updated code will increase it to 35%. So the A2 kind of acts more like a, and that's why it's called a suburban district, almost like a uh, single family, large lot type zoning. So it'll have similar lot coverage, but 35% in an A2 with most of those lot sizes will be uh, sufficient and shouldn't cause a problem. Now the residential zoning districts. Uh, as I had talked last time, we added RE and R3. RE is residential estates. Uh, in the comprehensive plan, uh, it had uh, indicated much like we've talked where there was the recognition of larger lots in our community, anywhere from one to three to five, even 10 acres. Uh, one of the issues we had with that was not only the accessory structures, but honestly our code is regulating them in a manner similar to a 7,000 square foot lot in the middle of the town. And even, as I said, our comprehensive plan made that distinction that those probably should function slightly different. It's still going to be a single family zoning, but it is going to allow animal privileges. So in that zoning district, you can have animals. Most of what we see out there is legal non-conforming, but if there's a property out there that has not had legal non-conforming animals, by code they can't have animals. And if you're on two or three lot, two or three acres, most people expect to maybe have, you know, a couple horses, maybe some cows or sheep or whatever. And so this zoning district will allow that to happen without having any issues in that. And again, as larger lots, I think that's, you know, a proper land use. Uh, the R3 will be what I call a true multifamily. Uh, right now we have two basically zoning districts, single family and multifamily. Uh, the R2 will become more of a limited multifamily, which will accommodate more of our uh, duplex or triplex, four units, that type of thing, that limited. And then when you want to do a true high density where you have maybe multiple buildings or up to maybe 20 uh, dwelling units per acre, now that would be an R3. So uh, once again, that's also outlined in our comprehensive plan. So a lot of this is just following what the comprehensive plan had uh, put forth. Uh, the R4 and even the R5 and R6, uh, we eliminated R5 because that was the planned unit development. R6 was a manufactured home. So now R4 acts as that mobile manufactured home zoning district. We actually have no properties in town zoned R4 and we had no properties in town zoned R6. So the change with that is going to have absolutely no impact whatsoever. But it is an opportunity if somebody wants to do a mobile home subdivision at uh, somewhere, we do have a zoning district to uh, accommodate that. The, uh, and as I indicated with the other one, there were some uh, minor changes for the land use table. Obviously, there was the addition of RE, which is residential estates. As you'll see, most of the uses that are either permitted, not permitted, or special use permits are consistent with R1 uh, because of the fact that it is a single family zoning. Uh, as I indicated, the big difference is RE will allow animal privileges. 
And the way I have it set up in there right now is animals will be based on your uh, lot, but it'll be on a, a basically a animal unit. And then you'll get certain amounts of animal units per half acre. So for instance, a horse, a donkey, or a mule is considered one animal unit. So on a half, if you have an acre lot, you can have two horses. If you have two acres, you can have up to four, and et cetera, et cetera. And so the different animal units uh, will be in that manner. So there will be a control on it to make sure that somebody doesn't have, you know, a, a 100 or 200 head cattle operation in, in the, in the uh, residential area in that. But again, the more property you have, the more ability you can have more of a ranch and, and horse uses in that. So uh, also you'll notice there was a requirement in there to have the, the uh, basically the barn in that, a certain distance from the dwelling unit uh, in that, and, or from uh, any other dwellings, churches, or neighboring properties. A lot of that goes back to, again, to make sure that somebody doesn't put their barn right on a property line or close to a property line and another house is next door, so it's kind of being the good neighbor type thing in that, but there's uh, that in there. And so with that... Uh, Where is that? Oh, I'm sorry. It's in the first part, and that's under the specific yeah, district regu regulations. Yeah, 2.2 A and B, and that's where it calls out the... Uh, the type of animal units and how many you can have, as well as the uh, oh, distance. Oh, there's the barn. Yeah, for the barn. And still, it, just like in the ag or the, or the RE and all that, uh, the city had adopted an ordinance, oh geez, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that any hog or swine type, uh, or, or hogs or swine of any regard are prohibited within the city limits, and that's still in place. Uh, that's not gonna change, so again, even in that area, you're not gonna have hogs as, as an option. It's gonna be, again, more of your cow, cows or horses, sheep, goats, that type of thing. So I need thing. to get rid of my 45 head of pigs? Yeah, you probably should. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and going on to the uh, sec, uh, the. Hi, Brian. Oops, I think it's there. Squeal on you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the dimensional one, standards. Uh, a couple things that were in there was, uh, again, in the RE, it's a minimum of one acre lot size. So again, uh, anything smaller than that, uh, you're not going to be allowed to have in the RE. So it's for any property that's one acre and above, whether you're creating new or even if you're looking to rezone to that particular zoning district, you would have to have at least one acre. Uh, the minimum lot sizes are uh, uh, consistent with what we have or stayed the same other than, again, we added RE. In the R3, it'll be a minimum of a 21,000 square foot lot. Again, uh, that's really not big for that or, or an outrageous requirement because you have to remember that's our high density in that. So a lot of those properties are probably going to end up being one to two acres. Uh, in that when it's uh, all said and done, but the minimum is uh, 21,000 square feet. One of the other things is, is I, I kind of cleaned up the minimum width. One of the things we had in our code is it said you can have 35 feet of frontage, but at the point you get to the building line, it has to be a minimum of 50 foot wide uh, in that. So basically it's almost like you can create a small flag lot and then expand it out. Uh, it's a lot easier just to be at the beginning saying 50 foot wide lot and be done with it. So then there's no issue. And, and again, it takes out a lot of weird shaped lots and, and that type of thing. So that's really what kind of got cleared up in that area. I did add densities that we currently don't have. Uh, and, and a large part of that was again to understand. And so it's fully known what each zoning district is trying to accomplish. So again, uh, RE is one dwelling unit per acre. Uh, the R1 did not change uh, in terms of density, it's just spelled out now, because currently we, uh, R1 is a 6,000 square foot minimum. So if you put one unit on a 6,000 square foot lot, it equates to roughly 7.25 or, or I think maybe slightly less, 7.16, something like that. So I just made it 7.25. The R2, that would be 12 units uh, 
dwelling units an acre, and again, that falls in line with a limited multifamily. So in a lot of cases, that will allow on a lot of the lots a duplex, triplex, fourplex type development. But as you'll notice, uh, the requirement that we have in the code still applies, and that's why I said it falls in the density, is currently you have to have 8,000 <coughs> square feet to put two units in R2. If you want a third unit, it has to be 10,000 square feet. And so for every additional unit that you add, you add 2,000 square feet of lot area. And if you do the math, it comes out to around 12 dwelling units per acre. So like I said, that really isn't changing, it's just spelling it out. And then as I indicated uh, before, the R3 is gonna be your high density uh, residential where you can have up to 20 dwelling units per acre. So it's gonna be, and then the same with the R4, the eight is consistent with what we have, which is basically one unit on a 5,000 square foot lot. The lot coverages again uh, would be proposing to be changed. Uh, one of the things that we currently have issue with honestly is our lot coverage in the R1. It's very restrictive for the most part. Uh, in that most codes will have anywhere from 35 to 45, some even as much as 50% a lot coverage in their uh, single family areas. Uh, I'm proposing 35%. Uh, I think that's adequate uh, for most of the instances that I've seen lately, whether it's somebody putting an addition to their house, trying to put you know, a house on the lot, uh, meeting a garage requirement, that type of thing, 35% seems to accommodate most every instance. Most of them fall in that 32, 33% range. But 25% has been a problem for even people wanting to put an addition on their existing homes, or as I said, you know, before when we were dealing with the mandatory two-stall garage, we would run into issues where they had to uh, decrease their house size in order to accommodate a two-stall garage. So again, with the increase in lot coverage, we kind of take care of those issues. That's way out of my wheelhouse, but why, what are your thoughts on that, Leroy? I mean, are we trying to be too restrictive on density here? It seems like that's pretty thin. The, uh, one of the things that plays into density is stormwater runoff. And so the more density you allow, the more intense or robust your stormwater detention is going to have to be. And so 25%, you got more permeable ground for it to soak in. If you allow 35%, when you look at a new subdivision uh, plat, that will have to be taken into consideration when you look at your stormwater plan, that 35% of that lot. So some of that ties back to planning for stormwater runoff. But 35% is pretty generous, and yeah. I have no problem with that. Yeah. yeah, and like I said, it's pretty typical. If you look at most codes, and even outside of Oklahoma, uh, usually the low end is 35. The high end you get into 45. I've seen some up to 50. So it does vary obviously per community, but 35 is usually about the low end. And so that's why I kind of went with that to not make it too much, but again, give a little bit more, uh, if you want to say leniency to what we have now uh, in that. And, and the same with the R2 and the R3. Uh, it's the same concept. In an R3, you're going to have some more units on that particular property in that, and especially the R3. So you logically need to have that, um, that lot coverage increase some, because if you have, uh, you know, an R2 where you have limited multifamily and you uh, limit it to 25 or 30% lot coverage, a lot of times in a indirect way, you're limiting density or development because they can't get, you know, density may say this, but lot coverage says this. And so that's why I tried to make all of that fairly consistent so we didn't have those issues again where, you know, one says you can, one requirement says you can do it and the next requirement says uh, not so quick. And again, the 45% the, uh, in an R2 and even 50% in the high density is pretty typical of most codes in most areas. As uh, Leroy indicated on development, whether it's a single lot or a subdivision, you know, all of that is going to be taken into consideration when doing uh, the drainage, just like a commercial building when they put in parking uh, surface as well as the building, all of that runoff and impervious service has to be taken into account for drainage. So, but again, it, it just keeps it to where we don't get the uh, different requirements uh, bouncing up against each other. And as I 
uh, said in the ag, I did the same thing with setbacks in the, um, in the zoning districts. I basically just cleared it up. Again, in the R1, it's 25 front, 20 rear, five on each side. That's basically what we have now. There were some exceptions that allowed <coughs> less setbacks uh, in the rear or lot coverage. You'll see there's still the ability for rear access or accessory structures off the alley, such as a garage, to be within three feet. But for your primary buildable area, your you know your house and anything attached to it, it's the 25. 20 in the rear, five on each side, which is what we have. So most of the setbacks are the primary setbacks we had. I just, again, took out a lot of the other stuff that really uh, didn't do help. It just made matters worse for the most part. Uh, and then the maximum heights uh, actually increased across the board, and that was at the recommendation of the Planning Commission. Uh, currently, we have 33 feet, like in the uh, R1, 35 feet, I think it's in the R2. And that, and they requested or they recommended that they go to 40 feet uh, in that. And a lot of it was just to, again, easily accommodate two story homes uh, in that or the, the homes and kind of, I think, make it more of an even number. Uh, I don't see that that's going to be a big drastic issue because most of the homes we have are going to be two stories and you're maybe 25 feet. Uh, something like that more so but it does add a little bit especially in the multifamily areas to where if you want to get a three-story building versus a two-story it accommodates that I don't see much three-story happening in in the uh, you know single-family areas but anyway that pretty much summarizes the changes in in regards to uh, the dimensional standards are there any questions on that if not I'll move on to the commercial side uh, one of the big changes on the commercial side was the addition of mixed use. Uh, as I had uh, indicated in my introduction, we actually have a zoning district that was like an entrepreneurial, I think commercial entrepreneurial district, that really to me was almost a, a, uh, a try at a mixed use. Uh, that would go away, but we would have a true mixed use. And uh, as I, when we talked about the definitions, this would allow for uh, commercial and residential to happen either on the same property or in the same building on the property. So again, it can work in a horizontal way where you may have some residential and then you have some commercial on the same property or like we see in the downtown where you have commercial on the bottom and then you have residential on the top. Uh, one of the provisions that I put in there to make sure that if you have a mixed use, you don't get it a full residential is there would be a limitation on the amount of residential. Basically, uh, I forget what I put it as. I think it was no more than uh, the, I think it was, years? no, that's another thing. That was it. Uh, that was another element, but it had a limitation on the amount of, uh, Residential, and again, it was primarily to make sure that it's a mixed use, so you don't get a true. Forty-five percent. Thank you. Yeah, so it would be a fifty-five forty-five. So a development have could have up to fifty-five commercial and forty-five percent residential, but it would make it to where it's still somewhat, or, or again, predominantly a commercial-based zoning. So again, we don't get seventy percent residential and thirty percent commercial. Because with any of those, it is more of a commercial base, so you want more commercial activities in that than you do the residential. Because once again, if you're going to the residential fact, go to you know we'll have it in a residential zoning district, not necessarily a mixed use. And the other thing that I had put in there is uh, within the C1. Right now, there's actually a limitation, or I should say, it requires a certain amount of the building to be used for something other than storage. So actually, in the R1 right now, you can't have a building used for nothing but storage uh, in that. You have to have some type of commercial use. So what I had put in there was not only that, but also the central business district to require that every building downtown have at least 60% of a commercial use. They can still have storage, they just can't have 100% storage. Uh, if you notice, we have a significant amount of buildings in our downtown that are storage buildings. 
uh, in that. And that's probably not conducive to what we want for the downtown and ultimately the business in the downtown. So this would put a limitation on it to, again, say, you know, you can have your storage, but you're going to have the majority of your building have an actual commercial uh, use or a functioning use. Uh, and like I said, we had that in our C1. So you're limiting the, the residential to 40% or 45? No, 45. No, what I was saying is, is on any building, I, I, I moved on to the central business. No, I know I'm C1. there, oh. but they tie together, do they not? He's talking about storage in this one, though. Okay. But yeah. But there, there is a limitation on the... Uh, is that all this one is, the storage to, down here? Yeah. The, the, the D talks about the basically the primary use of the building. Again, it takes away the primary use of the building being storage. So if you have, a, you know, a, a, again, a building downtown and you just want to store stuff in it, the code says no, you have to have some type of functioning business in there. So what do you do with the people that have those buildings with storage in it now? Are you prepared to enforce that if we approve this? To some extent, yes. And yeah. Or we're going to go over those enforcement actions, I assume, at one point. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and like a lot of things, too, it's there to prevent further uh, issues with that, you know, probably more so than everything. It. Yeah. Because, again, the last thing we want is the downtown to be full of the buildings that serve no, no other purpose than storage. So, Dan, how do you yeah. do a max footage back up to A, a. on uh, 45%? Let's say you have a building. Mm -hmm. And it's 10,000 square feet. Yeah. And it's two level. Yeah. Bottom's five, top's five. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, you want the top residential, you want the bottom commercial. Right. So there's going to be len leniency there, or you can only have your, I mean, because you're going to have 50% and 50% at that point. So I'm just curious at how we're going to shrink, keep this 45% under control when most of these buildings that have residential, don't they have the whole top? Yeah, but it doesn't, yeah. Uh, I mean, we can make, uh, probably make it, I mean, I guess we could, you know, even take that requirement out altogether. I, I see what 50, you're saying. 50, you know? Yeah, because there, there would be, you know, the possibility of some limitation if you're building a new building and you want to go maybe five stories. And, you know, you do the bottom commercial and then the top four stories you do residential. That obviously is going to exceed 45%. I don't know if we're ever going to see a five-story building such as that, but, you know, I understand your point. Or uh, the existing buildings that are two-story. Yeah, some of them might be 50-50. You're right. Not all of them. There's probably only a few of them that have the entire top I don't residential. Know. Yeah. Most of them have a portion, but m there's... The storage up yeah, there probably, too, or yeah. whatever. And, and really, again, the idea was to have it to where... In, uh, and it might be one of those things where, you know, now thinking of it, we could limit it when you have a horizontal development, meaning, you know, if somebody's having separate buildings, say, okay, we're going to need a mix of buildings of uses. So if you want a couple commercial and a couple residential, that's fine, but we're not going to have, you know, again, 20 residential buildings and two commercial. Uh, yeah, commercial. So I can massage that a little because that's a good point. That would that, be good. That well, could, and and, and in, in line with what he's talking about uh, on A and B or A and I think it's A and B, you're talking about going from a 45% square footage for a residential, which is 55 commercial, right? Yeah. Okay, but when you go to the 60-40 thing. I think it's kind of screwy. Why well, they need to be the same. Why because not just those leave them the same? Well, again, and include, there's it includes it's, storage on A, and then you're done. Yeah, but there, but that uh, it's two different uses. We're talking, you know, actual residential and commercial, and how they mix, and then again, just any building in terms of the primary use. The but why change it for the guy that has stored something upstairs instead of having residential stuff? Why does he have to have sixty percent instead of forty-five or instead of fifty-five? Make it fifty-five for everybody. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, we could. Yeah, that's... I mean, I, it just yeah. makes sense. It's yeah. a lot, should, lot should more It should be just 50-50 is what it should be. More, well, 50-50 yeah. is even good, I, but it's still but, more clear to do but it to go, well, But also to bring up, to go back to, you know, Brian's point, one of the things that's currently in the code, and it was done, and again, that was a few years ago. Honestly, I think it was done when the, uh, when the uh, Capitol Publishing Building was looking at uh, residential use. We currently have a provision that limits 
any residential use in, in the central business district to no more than 12 units. Yep. So the likelihood of somebody again, well, I should say we're not going to have a five story building necessary with four stories above and, and below. We likely maybe have a 50 50 mix at best because you probably could get maybe six units a floor, maybe five. Uh, in that, so you know, you figure at most probably two floors of residential, but even then, I'm not sure. But there is that limitation in there, so I can kind of work with that number and massage it to probably come out with something more consistent. All right, so we can talk about that next time. Yes, right? thank All you. All right, so uh, now we're to land use tables. There was some changes to the land use tables. Uh, not a great deal, but there were some. Uh, one of the things that I did, and it just makes things a lot easier so you don't have uh, four or five or six pages of land uses, what I did is combined a lot of them into the definitions as we talked. So like health and fitness centers. In the land use table, it has that, but if you go in the definitions, it has a laundry list of s those type of uses or similar type uses. And the same with retail and that. So when you go through the land use table, if you don't see some of the typical retail stuff, you just go to the definitions and it's a, and you see most of them in that. And, and again, it also goes to help when we have to make a determination on a use that isn't specifically in the land use tables, we can go back to the definitions and that, and it helps to say, yes, that is retail or it is health and fitness and that type of thing. But it also just kind of cleans up the, um, the land use table so you don't have a long uh, list of it. The, so what are our changes, oh. just the additions, I guess, right? Yeah, pretty much, because one of the things we added, because we don't have it in there, is a brewery restaurant, brew pub. Uh, in there, so it would be permitted in all the commercial zones except C1 uh, in that. Uh, C1 is more of your neighborhood commercial uh, type stuff, and so it t traditionally is for more uh, neighborhood type stuff, so that's why it isn't allowed in C1, but it's allowed everywhere else. Uh, the other thing that we changed, and actually coming in January, you'll have that Currently, bars, taverns, anything like that is a special use permit within the central business district. So if somebody wants to open up a bar or restaurant, they can't do it as a permitted use. So that's changing to allow that as a permitted use in all our commercial areas. So that'll get rid of the annual fee that the bars have had to pay? No. This is strictly the land use side. Okay. That's, a whole different, that's a whole different element. Because currently, not only do they have to... Not only do they have to do that, they have to go through a special use permit process, I, I you know, to establish. So, yeah, that, that's something to talk about uh, on another day and another item. All right. But one of the other things that I added in there, because we do have those uses, but once again, we don't really have any code uh, provisions that uh, deal with it. And I think it's important because it is a use that we want to encourage. And it has to do with um, like outdoor seating associated with a restaurant or a tap room bar type place. Currently our code doesn't address that, but I put it in there as a permitted use as long as it's accessory. Uh, but I also put if you have like a beer garden, so if you have nothing but a standalone kind of, again, beer garden, there's no restaurant or anything and it, it's just a beer garden, that would still require a special use permit. Uh, in that so it probably needs a little bit more uh, review for siting versus your you know typical uh, outdoor seating uh, type of thing now that beer garden would only be in an event thing right no it, are, you, are you talking about a permanent beer garden? yeah I'm talking if somebody wanted to do more like I said yeah of a permanent the events would be completely different because that's the recurrent but I, it's even like if you wanted to take maybe even, you know, like put four or five, six taco trucks on a property and something and, and have that on a more regular basis. Uh, not something we necessarily want to discourage, but I think it may be a use that we want to make right. sure that I there's guess. a little bit more review. So a lot of that would fall under kind of that beer garden. I just put it as a beer garden, but those type of uses would still require a special use permit. But again, if you're going to open a bar, you know, in that, and you want to have outdoor seating, you know, have at it uh, in that. So, again, those are the big changes. Again, added the uh, telecommunications towers uh, to it. The, going on to the um, dimensional standards. Before you go oh, yes. on telecommunications towers, yes. are those, are those going to be permitted at all 
Yes, yes we'll get to it. Yeah, because yeah. that's inside part inside the city. In yes, the they're, area. Yeah, they're I, doing that. I completely rewrote that section, uh, and it's part of Article Five that'll be coming up. There's a whole section on that, and it has my, the updated uh, stuff. Uh, in that, so we'll be going over that down I mean, the road. Most people don't want a radio tire in their backyard, so I just but curious. most people do want cell service in, at their in, house in commercial areas. <laughs> yes, but I'm just talking. No, no, about, you're exactly right. In, in, about, or, in yes. their backyard, do you want in, the backyard? No, no, I, I get that. Yeah, and the telecommunication portion of it covers all that. Uh, because the problem with our current ordinance, it doesn't clearly state where it is or isn't permitted, and honestly, it doesn't even clearly state how you go about permitting them. Mm -hmm. It basically just says the planning department should keep track of them. That's about it. Our water towers are a good asset for that. Yeah. No, exactly, because it still allows co-location. But anyway, that we'll, okay. we'll be going well, over to standards because that's on. in the next article. Uh, there really wasn't any changes... Um, to the uh, standards for that because in most of our commercial in that there are no lot coverages no setbacks or anything like that and so it really comes down to being able to put your building landscaping and all that and meet all of those requirements and that's pretty typical of most commercial areas in the c1 there are some setbacks in that that exist and that's again because it's in a neighborhood setting and so normally you uh, want to have that if you want to say fit in with the neighborhood so you will have more of the setbacks but all of that isn't changing it just kind of put it in a nice different looking table if you want to say so that moves us on to the industrial zoning districts uh what page is that I'm oh to... that that oh, well, would be just section it. four yeah four one. with the i1 i changed it to a light manufacturing and warehouse uh restricted just has a bad connotation to it. It just sounds like, you know, you it can't really restrict it. Right, exactly. So in most places, it's called light manufacturing. So that's what I changed it to. Uh, and one of the things that I did is in our current industrial zoning, again, it lists almost every possible use that is imaginable, some probably realistic, some not. And so we have this two, three, four pages of uses that uh, really we don't need to, I guess, have that long a list. One of the big things I did is created a general light manufacturing, a general heavy manufacturing, and a manufacturing assembly. And that kind of encompasses really what you're looking for in the light manufacturing to the heavy manufacturing and that. So that definition takes care of a lot of the areas that we don't necessarily need to try to spell out. As you'll see, there's still a lot of the primary stuff in there in terms of different uses, but that'll help a lot by, again, not having, you know, page after page of land use table. And more importantly, as, as I indicated, like with the commercial, you're going to have uses that aren't always in there. And so by having those definitions, we can more clearly say, yeah, that's a light manufacturing. You can go into I-1. No, that's a heavy manufacturing. You're going to go into I-2. Uh, in that because there's so many specialties in, in when you get into the industrial side in that it's hard to list them all. Uh, but really outside of that, that's pretty much the changes because again in the uh, other areas we have certain setbacks in the I-1 which are staying the same and then in the heavy manufacturing the couple of uh, setbacks we have are staying the same. It was just making the table consistent with the rest. Uh, in that. And then finally is the uh, added a public facility zoning district. Uh, once again, this is one of those that there's basically have an availability use. Uh, our comprehensive plan also indicates uh, that uh, zoning district, but it allows for us as a city or even a school in that to be a, uh, to rezone a property to public facilities uh, zoning. One of the benefits it does is if you look the um, dimensional standards and that how it lays out is basically consistent with the commercial. So again, there's not going to be specific setbacks or that it's putting the building on there in the parking and landscaping and all that and meeting the requirements. Because technically one of the things that we have is if you go and build a, you know, whatever in a uh, R1 area, you technically need to be abiding by the R1. 
a lot of times that's all not always conducive to public buildings, just like a city hall, you know, with the parking and other stuff. So this just gives the availability that if there is an opportunity at some point or something comes along, we could rezone it. We're not gonna go out and rezone all the city properties to PF, but again, it's, it, it's in the availability for the code. Because like we talk with a lot of stuff, hopefully this is gonna carry us for the next 10 to 20 years without a whole lot of you know updates or issues. So we have to look towards the future. And then finally, floodplain, uh, that was an existing one. We don't have any areas designated floodplain. Uh, honestly, the uh, flood maps take care of a lot of that without having a zoning district. But again, it's just in there bec uh, in that because- uh, I notice you have hogs in your floodplain. Uh, in my but you don't have you they're banned everywhere else i'm a little curious on I, and obviously i was joking about that i got no pigs. right i don't have pigs uh, and i don't know if anybody does but i'm curious of the banning of that just out of curiosity why would we oh you know it? i just missed that because I, I that was a portion that you know should have been amended when they did the code because like i said i didn't change anything in there and i just missed that but i will take that out but why would we i guess where i'm going with this is why are we banning hogs of period there was i understand the hog farm no 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 right hog. i was honestly i don't know because i wasn't here <laughs> all i can tell you is apparently there was a desire to make sure there were no type of hogs in any form in the city why i i honestly don't know because i wasn't here because it the ordinance is probably i don't know 10 10 years old or so, I don't know. I could look it up, but I, I, I don't know. So that, so we're saying that would only pertain then to poultry and, and, uh, and livestock? Yeah, well, yeah, like cattle or that. Yeah. The hogs would be eliminated because currently it does. I just missed that because like I said, it was an existing yeah, district, so. But yeah, like I said, I don't know the original reason or concerns that there were about no hog well, they probably don't want a hog farm I no guess. yeah, no, I understand that. But yeah, <laughs> this eliminated it in any regard because technically even your Pot belly pets aren't allowed in town. Yeah, it's yeah. crazy. Yeah, so. so anyway, that takes care of Article 4. So if there's no other questions, we can. So uh, can we address the hogs in your zoning deal on the next time? Yeah, I mean, there's two elements to that because we do have, kind, we have the zoning side, but we also have a animal portion of our municipal ordinance. Uh, with that regard, that would probably be better in the municipal ordinance because then it goes more with the animal control side of it and that more so the zoning side. But we could accommodate it either way. The thing we have to make sure is that we have consistency. But it's definitely something that can be considered. Like I said, I, you know. I'd just like to know yeah. the rationale behind that. Yeah. So going on to uh, Article 5, which is Section 1. Uh, Again, a lot of this just kind of lays out, uh, and in this case, too, relationship to other, other regulations in that. I just kind of fixed the verbiage. It doesn't change really the intent or anything of what it's doing. It's just talking about that, you know, if there's conflicts in that, basically the zoning requirements trumpet uh, type of thing. So uh, again, I just fixed the verbiage. And the same with the interpretation and unlisted uses. I've already talked about this. It's in there. So uh, the planning director, if there's a use that isn't otherwise listed in places or there's a concern about it, we can make a determination uh, based on the different elements uh, in the code in that. Uh, so it just, again, put a lot of that happens. It just wasn't in the code. So it just helps to shore some of that up. The special use permit section stays exactly the same. Uh, that's the existing code, nothing changes in that. So there were no changes to section three special use permit. Then going on to open space, there were a couple changes in there and, and uh, one of them was, uh, let me see here. I was gonna get my PowerPoint going up. One of the things that we, that the first part of it uh, talks about is in our original platted areas uh, in that, you know, the Guthrie Proppers, the Capitol Hills uh, subdivisions and those, our code uh, allows for some exceptions to setbacks, especially the front setback. And, and what it says is you have the ability to line up the house with the person next door. One of the things that it didn't do was require that. Now with the Guthrie proper overlay district, you may remember it requires it, but this was uh, giving some exception to the side yards and the front yards, given the fact that those were smaller lots, most of them are, are 50 by 140, original ones 25, but combined. So it 
give some exceptions to that. 62. <laughs> yeah, section four. Yeah, those are the same. I'm not sure your page. One of the things that I was looking at changing is with these 50 foot wide lots, we're having issues with corner lots. The corner lots are, or the street side corner allows uh, 15 feet uh, setback. And so with your interior side lot, you have five feet. So you take a 50 foot wide lot and you narrow it down to 30. A typical interior lot will obviously have 40 feet because if you're 50 and five and five on each side. Uh, it's caused some issues. In fact, we have one going to the Board of Adjustment because it, it's caused one issue. The other thing that it prevents is most of the, uh, these lots that would qualify for that are built at about a five foot setback off that side street property line. So even when you get kind of looking at the character of the neighborhood and keeping things consistent, not only on the front, it creates the same issue on the side yard if you have this one set in at 15 feet and then this one back over here at five. That whole aesthetics and character uh, becomes an issue. So the code would allow for a 50 foot wide and uh, that to only require a five foot street side setback versus the 15 feet. But if you have a larger lot, then you lose that. So if you have a 60 foot wide lot or whatever, you go back to your standards uh, in that, just so we make sure that, you know, we don't have, I guess, taken advantage of that. Hey, Dan. Yes. <clears throat> Since we're getting near the end of our time, I need to, we, we skipped over about three pages. <laughs> which ones so were those? I want to go back. Okay, which one? Uh, no, that's fine. To page 59. Um, which one was that? Because mine's well, that's a section short. two interpretation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uses. Yeah, yeah. Well, I noticed the planning director, you, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we're giving, in this, we're giving you the authority basically for everything here. Now, I know we discussed that in some of the cases last time, but this is. Uh, I just think we need to go through this and be clear okay. of what we're given here and what we're doing in this section. And I was trying to read through this while you were going through the other sure. one, and I apologize I didn't read it in advance. No, that's okay. Um, it, and if I can, in a nutshell, what it's saying is, again, there's no way that anybody can know for sure what uses may come about in terms of different zoning districts and in that. And so, you know, just like Airbnbs is a good example. Five, 10 years ago, nobody talked about Airbnbs. Now you have Airbnbs. And, you know, you have some uses to where it does not fit perfectly within a, a element of our land use table. You, you know, so again, if somebody comes in and wants to do an antique shop, that's pretty straightforward. But you get sometimes where people want to do uh, maybe a di couple different types of uses or again, uses that aren't there. What this says is that the planning director can then go and go, okay, here's what's proposed as the use. Now, what other uses are going to be similar or have similar characteristics? That's where definitions come in, other land use types come in, and I can make a determination to say, okay, based on what you're doing, based on what the different uh, uses are in the codes and the definitions, you now are in a C2 zone, or you will need a special use permit for whatever. That's what it's saying. It doesn't give me the authority to do really anything else. I don't have the authority to, you know, exempt any other regulations or that. It just gives the ability, because otherwise what we end up doing is every time somebody comes in with a use that isn't otherwise listed, we say, all right, well, you got to go to the planning commission or the city council. So they're thrown into a 60 or 90 day process just to determine. No, I get that, yeah. that you should have that right. authority, right. some authority to be able to make a quicker right. ruling, but interpretations, you might interpret one thing that case interprets totally different. Interpretations are, that's, right. the, but thing, those that's the word of verbiage I don't like. Right, here. but <laughs> that's, I mean, to some extent that's already there because if somebody doesn't, agree with my interpretation, then they can appeal that to the Board of Adjustment. And the Board of Adjustment can say, you were right, you were wrong uh, in that. So there is an appeal process for that. And it's on either side, whether I make a determination or an interpretation to this and somebody says, no, you're way off, that that shouldn't be allowed. It can be appealed to the Board of Adjustment and this, you know, in either, either fashion. And that's pretty typical of, of 
you know, most planning, if you want to say, a lot of places have, you know, a person that's the zoning administrator, that's their title, and that's what they do, uh, you know, part of what they do. Obviously, we just have the planning director. So that's what it's saying. So if there is a disagreement, there still are processes in place to uh, go elsewhere to say, yeah, you're right or you're wrong. And it's just like the building side, you know, we, we actually have an appeals process for that too if there's an interpretation on, on the building side uh, in that. Yeah, so. but you're determining entire zones at this point. You're determining that it's a complete different zone <laughs> than what they're in. That's, I mean, you're, that's a big deal, isn't it? Or, or no, maybe it's not. No, what I I'm mean, saying what is think, it, it's, it's not saying that we're changing zoning districts or anything. Again, it, it's all predicated on a particular use. So again, if somebody has, you know, whatever use they are looking to do and we can't clearly find it in our land use table, this gives a interpretation ability. I understand. And it's, and it's gonna hopefully speed things up, I get that. Yeah. Leroy's got a question. <coughs> or an answer. One of the uh, flaws in this concept is if I'm an individual and I want to build X, Y, Z, and I come in and it's not in the uh, listing of things available, and the planning director looks at it and says, well, that fits in C1 or C2 uh, because it's similar to other things in that list. Okay. That's one thing because that's the individual. He can appeal that if he disagrees with Dan. <clears throat> but if it affects a neighborhood or a business district and Dan makes that interpretation, they don't know to appeal that until the building permit's already been issued. So there has to be some limitation because what if a neighborhood has a different interpretation? They won't even know to appeal that because they don't have any notice that Dan has said well, X, Y, Z fits in this category as a permitted use because it's similar to these things. So what would the sense. language have to be? So are you saying that you you're, agree with you're, this language? You're ahead. I'm a remedial reader, and you're all way ahead of me, and I've got questions. So that we're going to come back to this is yes. what the bottom line yeah. is. I've not got to that point yet. Okay. I'm a I just wanted to make I'm sure that we weren't reader. just going to leave that because I do... There are some questions. Not that you're not trusted. Damn, we're going to be here forever. Someday that position may be somebody else. Yeah, but that it, it goes with the position more than anything. I mean, honestly, the, the answer is then any use not listed, you make a special use That's permit. Uh, That's the alternative. I think you're doing a good job on this so far, but there are some questions. That would be a slow, a slow process. Oh, sure. Yeah, and you're going to have a lot of people that just say, well, forget it, I'm going elsewhere. But honestly, that's you know probably your only alternative. All right, so more to come on that. Yeah. Are we done? Well, what I'll do is is I'll get through because these next two are going to be really quick because there's no changes in height. We're holding you to it. Yeah. The lights came on. That's why. Right. There's changes <laughs> in height, which there's no changes, and all it talks about is how we figure height, literally. Section six, which is architectural design, accessory buildings, and fences. The only change, this is the one we recently had adopted uh, and is now in effect. There is a couple changes to that. One, it's just accommodating the new zoning districts because those weren't around obviously when we did that. So it's just acknowledging RE uh, and R3. And then the other big change of that area is the allowance of accessory dwelling units. Uh, in that and actually that might be a good place to stop to be honest with you because yeah. there might be questions in that so we'll we'll pick up with accessory dwelling units uh, at the next one uh, in that and just real quick before we end in the staff report you kind of saw my timeline of, of what I was hoping or expecting mm -hmm. you know once again if that goes more then that's fine uh, you know because this is something we need to make sure everybody's on board with and happy with so 
Uh, that's just, again, I, a timeline to I, hopefully keep us kind of on course, but if that changes, then so be it. So well, you're doing a good yeah, job, good. Dan. Oh, thank good. you. Good. A lot of work. All right. Yeah. Leroy, right. question. I would just point out that um, Dan's going through this in general terms while changes and stuff. At some point, we've got to come back to specific questions because the mm -hmm. devil's in the details. Right. And we hadn't got into it, but if you look at my yellow taps, those are my questions on just the first half of it. So at right. some point, we're going to have to spend some time going through the detailed questions. Is there a chance I can get a copy of that? <laughs> so that I can do the same thing, Leroy, because I can't do that here. A hard copy? Yeah. I yes. Hard copy. Yeah. I'd love to have one. Yeah. Yes. I might need one in the future anyway. Well, no, that's fine. Yeah, because... Well, it's... maybe you want to do that on our last meeting of this... Or, or first meeting in January. Let's, does anybody else fine. want a separate hard copy printed out? Yes. I'd, okay. I'd take one, too. Well, I'll just make one for everybody. Yeah, I, I think yeah. We, uh, we, that way <laughs> we have have the I just, you know, page. one way I tried to say paper, but if we need to, yeah. then that's Can I have a stack of sticky notes <laughs> with Do you mind putting it in a nice binder yeah, and stuff posters. and labeling it? Yeah. <laughs> you can't be yellow. <laughs> yeah. All right, any other questions of Dan? Can you bind it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> we are we are.